The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Some Pharisees approached Jesus and asked, Is it against the law for a man to divorce his wife? They were testing him. He answered them, What did Moses command you? Moses allowed us, they said, to draw up a writ of dismissal and so to divorce. Then Jesus said to them, It was because you were so unteachable that he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. That is why a man must leave father and mother, and the two become one body. They are no longer two, therefore, but one body. So then, what God has united, man must not divide. Back in the house, the disciples questioned him again about this, and he said to them, The man who divorces his wife and marries another is guilty of adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she is guilty of adultery too. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Very good morning to you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. So today in the first reading, we saw God saying, it's not good for man to be alone. Let us make him a helpmate, a helper. Ayo, pity all the priests. La. Church does not allow us to get married. <laughs> okay. Anyway, did you, just to start off on a light, uh, light side for the beginning, because we have some difficult topics to handle in today's homily <laughs> as we arrive at the gospel. Anyhow, do you all know that there are Catholic priests who are married? Did you all know that? Anybody knows that? You all know that, huh? Okay, good. So our visitation Catholics are quite well educated in the faith, huh? That's good. Yeah, in fact, it's, uh, there are many Catholic priests from the Eastern Rites. Yeah? These are in countries that are in Eastern Europe, for example. Yeah, they are Catholics also, in union with the Pope in Rome, they are part of our church. But in their churches, the tradition is such that their priests are married. Only the bishop is single, only poor bishop has to suffer. And all the monks, the monks also. Okay? So in fact, there is nothing, how to say, uh, contrary for holy orders and holy matrimony to be lived in the one same person okay they are not mutually exclusive now unfortunately unfortunately a father belongs to roman right majority of catholics all of you included belong to roman right yeah, we are roman catholics right we are roman right catholics and in our church celibacy is practiced for the priests so if you want to become a priest, you feel God is calling you to be a priest, then you have to promise to be celibate. Yeah? Not because, again, that matrimony is uh, not compatible with holy orders. No, not because of that. We have married priests. But because it makes us more available for service. You know, it's quite hard if you have to manage your own family and then you have to do all the church work which pays you pittance or nothing at all. It's kind of hard. So we make it as a sacrifice. So we sacrifice married life, we sacrifice family life so that we can be available, more available yeah, for the needs of the church. So it's a little sacrifice that the Roman church asks of us who want to become priests. Okay. So anyhow, the problem is if you are born in the wrong right, too bad. You have to follow that. It's not easy to change rights in the Catholic Church. If you are born in the Roman Rite, you are there until the day you die. Yeah? Okay. So now, holy matrimony, holy orders. Both are holy sacraments of the Church. Yeah? So, all these sacraments that we have, you know how many we have, right? We have seven sacraments. 
Now, these seven sacraments are ways for us to be holy. Through these sacraments, we receive the grace of God, the sanctifying grace of God. And the sanctifying grace of God, what does it do? It helps us to become holiness. So now, to become holy. So if you are a married person, know that your path to holiness is one of the ways through your married life. So by being a good spouse and on top of that also being a good parent, yeah, if God has blessed you with children, being a good spouse and a good parent, that is part of your way of glorifying God by your life. Okay, just as for me, on the other hand, is to be a good priest. And through the life of the priesthood, I also can grow in holiness. Okay, so these are both holy sacraments. And the church holds all sacraments in very high esteem. Okay, all right then. So if you are a married person, know that that is your path of holiness. In and through your marriage, God will sanctify you. Now, we all know that marriage is not a bed of roses. You all know, la. I don't know. <laughs> but from what I see, with all the difficulties, people come and tell me, and just observing, oh, yo, I think it's really sometimes a heavy cross. <laughs> so maybe Father is lucky, I don't have to carry that cross. Yeah? Okay, but we have other crosses to carry. Anyhow, through your married life, can you give glory to God? And yes, the answer is yes. You have many opportunities, for example, to practice self-denial. Many opportunities to practice love. Many opportunities to practice being generous with your time and energy for your loved ones. You have so many opportunities also to pray with your family and together as one family to grow into the family of God, which happens to be the theme for today's Mass, huh? the family of God. So know that every Catholic household, every family is a domestic church. When we think of church, we might think just of our parish, of this big visitation church, right? But actually, every household where there is a father and a mother and children, every family, no children also, does not matter because you may not have children yet perhaps or not able to, but you are married. That household is also a house of God because it is a domestic church. Now, have you ever thought of your own house where you stay as a house of God? Have you? Have you ever realized that where you are as a Catholic practicing your faith with your spouse and your children, there also the church exists? Yeah? And so, fittingly, in every Catholic house, you should have an altar as a reminder that your house is also a holy place, not just the church. And you there are the priests ministering to all those who come to your house. And you are God's servant serving the people from your own little church that is your home. And of course, if your home is a house of God, it should be peaceful. It should be a place of happiness. It should be a place of solace and joy. And it should be a place where people can experience the love of God. Okay, so just a reminder today about the domestic church that is present in each one of our households. Okay, and this is possible because of the sacrament of holy matrimony. Okay, so such a significant, important sacrament. Now, coming to the more difficult points to talk about, in today's gospel, Jesus reminds us that divorce and remarriage is something that is contrary to what God wants. And we can understand this. If we understand it 
from the perspective of what matrimony is and what matrimony symbolizes and what matrimony really brings into this world as God's instrument of love and peace and joy. So when you break this sacrament, it is in fact a grave sin. Yeah? And the Catholic Church has been very faithful to the teachings of Jesus. There's no way around what we read in today's Gospel. There's no way around it. The very words of Jesus. And so we continue to teach despite a lot of people criticizing our church for being traditional and not open-minded enough, being too strict and conservative and whatever it is, we continue to teach what we believe is the teaching of Jesus. And that is, there is no divorce and remarriage. Yeah? Now, let me qualify that. Sometimes there may be a need for a divorce. For why? For legal reasons. To sort out property, to sort out custody of the children. Separation is not always the best solution. When a marriage breaks down, you might need to get a legal divorce. Yeah? And that's not the problem. The problem will then become if after you have a legal divorce, you fall in love with someone else and you decide to get married civilly. The church, of course, will not allow you to marry because we still recognize the first marriage, the one that broke down. Nah. Isn't it so? So we still recognize it, especially if it was done in the church. It was a full Catholic sacramental marriage. We are sorry that the marriage broke down for whatever reasons. Don't go into who is to blame and what happened, all that. Every story is different, usually very tragic, because in fact nobody arrives at the altar to marry their forever sweetheart and then five years down the road divorce them. Nobody comes to the altar with that intention. I'm going to get married only for five years, then I'm going to get divorced. They come with a good intention, with a real intention, with an authentic love, and they say, I do. But do not know what happened after that. Okay? And no judgmentalness, no condemning anyone. Huh? Yeah? It's just a fact. Marriages happen and marriages break down. And sometimes divorce takes place and the story continues. Now what to do? We have to minister also to people who have gone through a divorce because they may be broken, they may be in need of the support of our community. Now, how are we going to support them if we are there condemning them? We should not. Okay? That is not our role. As much as we want to uphold the sanctity of marriage, just remember that we should always treat everybody with kindness and love. And understand that more often than not, they need your support at that time because they are going through a lot of pain and suffering also. Okay? Again, we are not called to be part of the who is to blame, who caused the marriage to break down, not for us to do that. Our task is to be there to support our grieving, our suffering, brother and sister, whose marriage has broken down. Okay? And then maybe struggling also with the children and so many other issues, financial issues and all that. It's not the time to go and tell them, oh, you committed a sin by divorcing. Who knows who committed the sin? Maybe nobody committed sin also. We do not know. Alas, a lot of unfortunate things that happened during the course of the marriage and that led to its breakdown. So always be understanding, compassionate, not judgmental. So first point uh, to bring there, yes, God doesn't want divorce, but sometimes it will happen. And when it happens, we must minister to our faithful with kindness, with gentleness, yeah? trying to give, give them the assistance that they need. Okay, now, as I said, the next dimension is that sometimes people will be divorced, then later on they fall in love with someone else. They find another partner. And if the first marriage cannot be annulled, you can try to get your marriage annulled. Yeah? Church allows annulment, which is different from divorce. So what is an annulment? Sorry, a lot of footnotes today. I hope you won't be confused. <laughs> Only once a year we get to speak about the teaching on marriage because the gospel appears, this gospel appears once a year. And so it will be a little bit long today to make sure everybody is catechized correctly. 
annulment is not the same as a divorce. Eh? Annulment is saying the marriage that took place was actually not a real marriage. So how can that happen? Maybe they arrive at the altar, one of them was forced to get married. Maybe they arrive at the altar and there was deception. One of them actually has another person outside keeping as a spare wife or a spare husband, whatever it is. So only later on you realize you are cheated. Okay, so in this kind of cases, or perhaps they arrive at the altar and they have no intention of bringing up a family. Though they are young, able to have children, but they actually do not want to have children. So in all those kind of cases, it's possible to get the marriage annulled. So to annul means to say that, not that there was a marriage and now we are breaking it, is to say that there was actually no marriage, but a simulation of a marriage. Okay, so this is another thing, annulment. Okay, but anyhow, so sometimes marriages break down, people will try to get the marriage annulled, but maybe the church will investigate and say no. Everything is there. You married with the right intention. You married with no deception, not under force or duress. Nothing to say that the marriage is not valid. We are sorry that the marriage has broken down, but it was a real marriage. Therefore, we cannot permit you to marry again. Okay, I hope nobody has lost me. So all these very complicated things. Okay, so you have divorce, you have divorce and remarriage, you have annulment. Oh, so, okay, such a complicated thing. All right, but important thing, let us remember, uh, these are not matters for us to look at in a very indifferent manner. Remember that these are real couples, real people who are going through real crisis and pain and suffering. And that should orientate how we treat them. Okay, not with disdain, not with judgmentalness, not with harshness, not with unkindness. But instead, with love, with understanding, with patience, with compassion, with gentleness. Okay, that point remember, like this. If you even if you're confused about all the divorce and the annulment, all, never mind. But how should we treat people who are in such situation? Yeah, I hope we get that. Now, Father is taking out his handphone. I didn't receive a call from my sweetheart, don't worry. <laughs> okay, I am opening up something to read to you because this is an important doctrine. And in case somebody doubts and says, maybe Father is not teaching us the right thing. Maybe Father is too soft-hearted, too kind. Actually, we should wall up these fellas so that they won't do such thing anymore. We should really, you know, scold them nicely. They are being a bad example in our community. This Father too kind. La. Something is like not good. You know, and they say he should be more strict. Strictness never helped in any way. But anyhow, that's not the point. The point is, what I'm telling you today is the teaching of the church not an individual's opinion. So I want to read to you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We belong to the Catholic Church. Huh? Our official teaching is in a document, quite a big book, quite hard to read, that is called the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And of course, there is a teaching on marriage, on divorce and all of that in this document of the church. So I would like to read to you, quote to you, word for word, so that you know that what I am preaching to you today is not just my own doctrine, but it is the doctrine of the church. Okay, uh, bear with me. It's a long quotation. Catechism the Catholic Church tends to be very long-winded because these are all complicated issues. You cannot explain in few words. Okay, so Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1650. 1650. I know some might be taking notes, huh? 1650. Today, there are numerous Catholics in many countries who have recourse to civil divorce and contract new civil unions. In fidelity to the words of Jesus Christ, whoever divorces his wife and marries another, commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, 
she commits adultery. The church maintains that a new union cannot be recognized as valid if the first marriage was. If the divorced are remarried civilly, they find themselves in a situation that objectively contravenes God's law. Okay? Consequently, okay, there is a consequence. Eh? Consequently, they cannot receive Eucharistic communion. They cannot receive Eucharistic communion as long as this situation persists. For the same reason, they cannot exercise certain ecclesial responsibilities. Reconciliation through the sacrament of penance can be granted only to those who have repented for having violated the sign of the covenant and of fidelity to Christ and who are committed to living in complete continence. Okay, so this is teaching of the church. Okay, and to summarize very clearly, it says divorce and remarriage, civil remarriage, especially if, uh, not especially if, when the first marriage is a valid one, this is something that is wrong. Okay, there is a consequence. What is the consequence? Persons in such situation, the church does not allow them to receive Holy Communion. Uh, that one I think everybody knows. Okay? And on top of that, they cannot exercise certain uh, responsibilities in the church. Now, the interesting thing that often we don't see is the sentence that comes after that. Reconciliation through the sacrament of penance can be granted. And it tells you in what situation and under what conditions. So, okay, so if you are a Catholic who is, in fact, divorced, civilly divorced and remarried civilly, the church allows you, invites you to speak to the priest, go for confession, and if you are willing to promise before God and the church that you will remain continent, okay, which means you are going to live as brother and sister, Though you are staying under the same household, you may have children already, all right? though your marriage is invalid, your vocation as a parent is still valid. Huh? You have to take care of your children that have come from this union. So you're still in one household, but you promise God that you will now live as a brother and sister. Okay? And you don't need to tell the whole world about it. You don't need to tell your children about it even. It's between the couple and the priest will know, but the priest will also forget about it because this is told in the sacrament of penance. All right? So there is this possibility whereby having gone to confession and promising that they will live as a brother and a sister, still taking care of their children under one household, they can be allowed to receive Holy Communion. So this is important for us to know. Because in our Catholic Church, there is quite a bad culture these days of people policing who is receiving communion. Uh, this is a real issue. You come to church to worship during the Mass and to receive communion, but do not know who told you you have the responsibility to look left and to look right and to see who is going to receive. Huh? Oh my, my relative who actually is divorced and remarried. Huh? The fellow is going for communion. I better go and tell father. Quickly come to the front. Father, father. That fellow, I know his case. He is actually a divorced and remarried fellow. He's coming for communion. You don't give him father. Church does not allow him to receive communion. You put the priest in a very difficult situation. There we are giving out body of Christ. This person comes and tells us. What do you expect the priest to do? Please don't do this, brothers and sisters. You come to church, you look at the Eucharist, you observe, you pray during the Mass. Who is coming communion? Please don't see. Actually, I should not give you communion because you are not preparing yourself for communion. You are seeing who is going for communion. Why? Why this policing? And you know, there's nothing the priest can do. Because, do I have to believe your testimony? 
Am I to conduct a trial at that moment, stop the communion, and then conduct the investigation there and there? No. So the person comes, what can I do? So you put the priest in a very difficult situation. Don't do that. It's not right. Okay? And for all you know, they may have gone for conversion and they may have promised before God they are going to live as brother and sister. They already reconciled with the church. But they didn't have to tell you. And neither can the priest tell you. Because you know why? Sacramental seal. Whatever you tell the priest in confession, the priest cannot tell outside. If he does so, he commits a grave sin. And the church will punish him for it. We cannot break the seal of confession. So I cannot tell that person, hey, they came for me to confession when they go away. I can't even say that. I should not say it and I must not say it because then I'm breaking the seal of confession. So please, my dear brothers and sisters, as much as we have zeal and love for the Eucharist, nobody here has been tasked by the church to be like a police officer and observe who is going for communion and who is not going for communion. We have to stop this culture. Because when we keep this culture in our church, the divorce and the remarried, they will feel so awkward to come to church. They will feel so rejected. They will feel so unwelcome. Including those who have reconciled with the church. They will feel so shameful to come. Because people are always looking and judging and condemning them and then go and inform priests. In Bahasa, we have our language, national language, no? Jaga tepi kain orang lain. Have you all heard that? Please lah. Let us not do that. Tolong jangan te, jaga tepi kain orang lain. We're still in the church. You are not here for that purpose. You are here to worship God. And don't worry, if somebody who should not receive communion comes up for communion, somebody like a non-Catholic, right? We will know because they will not know how to receive the communion. You know, they may not know how to say Amen. The priests, the communion ministers will ask them, you know, are you a Catholic? And they will say, no, I'm not. No, we won't give communion then. We'll say, oh, okay, thank you for coming to our church. Let me give you a blessing. Huh? And usually nothing, no embarrassment, nothing. We welcome them, we give them a blessing. We take back the Holy Communion. Nicely, gently, very beautifully handled. No embarrassment for anyone. Okay, now oh, in that case, yes, but all other cases, person is divorced, remarried, and all these things, all even if the priest knows, he can't do anything about it. And yes, to those who are non Catholics, we cannot give communion, that's very clear, and there's no circumstance under which that they can, but not so the case for the divorce and the remarried, they have a way out. They have a way to receive communion. And since there is that way, we have to give the benefit of the doubt. Because we do not know. They may have gone to confession to another priest, not to me. They may have gone to confession five years ago and already promised God that they are going to live as brother and sister. How am I to know? That's why we will not refuse communion. Even if a relative comes and reports to us as we are giving communion, We'll just tell the person, okay, thank you, uh, you go back to your seat, we'll handle the matter. And what will happen? We'll give the Holy Communion because there's no way for us to ascertain the veracity of the accusation. And that is not the moment to verify anything. Okay, so, but I hope you all get my uh, point. Let us not make people feel uncomfortable coming to church. And since the church allows a way for them, we should not become an obstacle. Okay? Now, sorry, one last point. Another thing from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, that 
is good for us to recognize, and this is the, the main point I want to give for today's homily, actually. And it is also about the divorce and the remarried. Okay, we know already, church says it is wrong. We know already they cannot receive communion unless they go for confession. They promise before God to live as brother and sister. We've got all these points already. Now there's one more point that I want us to take home today with us. And I'm going to ask you all first in the form of a question. You don't have to answer, don't have to raise your hands, just to check yourself to see whether you are on the right path or not. Are people who are divorced and remarried separated from the church? I uh, don't need to say the answer. In your heart, you just... Father, ask a question. Huh? Are people who are divorced and remarried civilly, huh? are they separated from the church or not? Okay. One second, two seconds. Okay, you got your answer. Okay, we see who score 100% marks huh, for this. <laughs> and the answer is, no, they are not. Now, is this a teaching of the church? Or is this just the opinion of the priest who is preaching? It's the teaching of the church. Let me read to you from Catechism of the Catholic Church 1665. The remarriage of persons divorced from a living, lawful spouse contravenes the plan and law of God as taught by Christ. They are not separated from the church. But they cannot receive Eucharistic communion. They will lead Christian lives, especially by educating their children in the faith. So this is what the church says of persons in such situation. You may not receive communion, true, unless you go through sacrament or confession, promise to live as brother and sister. But you are not separated from the church. Now, if the church says they are not separated from the church, who are we as individuals to ostracize them, to persecute them, to make them feel shameful, to stigmatize them? Who gave us that right to do that? Even if it is our family member. Treating them as though they are separated from the church. The Catholic Church declares they are not separated from the church. Let us not separate them. By whose authority have we to do such a thing? When the Church of God has proclaimed they are not separated from the church. And yes, they can live a Christian life. Emphasis given especially through educating their children in the faith. So remember, today's homily, the other thing for us to learn, no ostracization of couples who are in irregular situations. Nobody here has the right to do that. Nobody here has the right to say, you don't come to our BC. You're a bad example for the other couples and for our children. No one has a right to do that. They have a place in this church. They are part of our community. They are still part of the family of God. Let us remember that. And not only let us act with charity, but also let us act according to the truth. And this is the truth that the church teaches. They are still family. And yes, as we sang in the entrance hymn, all are welcome, all are welcome. What more? Members of our church family. Members who are not separated. They may be in an irregular situation. And yes, the church does not allow them to receive Holy Communion. But they have a place still in our community. And we should treat them with respect, with love, 
and with kindness. And I hope that if we know people who are in such situations, who have left the church because they feel they have no place here, because they feel that they will be persecuted here, ostracized here, condemned, I hope that from today, they will have a place and they will return to the church. Because sadly to say, these words that I'm speaking now, the people who need to hear it may not be here. They may still think that I am ostracized. They might still think there is no salvation for me. They might still think I'm condemned. They might still think in the church, in the church community, I'm a pariah. No, you are still a dignified member of our church. Please return. And if needs be, go and speak to the priest. If possible, do your confession. And if you are able to, at that point, to say, because I love God so much, I am going to give up marital relations with my spouse so that I can receive Holy Communion, then God be praised. The moment of your complete and total reconciliation with God and the Church has arrived.